Imagine this, you're living in the early 20th century, you're off with your family to the local pitches to watch the most recent feature length movie. There may be some shorts and cartoons spliced in the reel before the main presentation, and then years down the line you may be discussing with a friend or family member, oh do you remember that scene from that movie? Never expecting to see that film ever again. These companies that were making these pieces of media may have been quite flippant upon these pieces of work. They may see a film can in their archive, realise that it was an old silent movie, and may think to themselves, now that's dated, who's going to want to watch that? It seemed like nothing was truly treasured, unless if it had any further resale value. Well, when films were starting to be re-released in cinemas, it seemed like a good enough reason to keep hold of the can. But still, in this discussion of preservating stuff, there would even be smaller things that film companies wouldn't even think twice of keeping. That didn't seem like a big deal at the time, but today is a huge loss for film history. While now we have the full length original King Kong picture to enjoy, searches for its pre-release cut, such as the missing spider pit scene, have proven to be fruitless. The outtakes from that movie seem more than likely to be forever lost. While no known copies survive of London After Midnight, we still have other Cheney films that have survived, such as the 1923 movie The Hunchback of Notre Dame, but no original 35mm negatives still exist. All we have today is 16mm dupes of a copy of a copy, making modern day HD restoration so much more difficult. Exactly when the preservation of film and television became more serious does vary from company to country to country, but if we're just strictly talking about the American market, then there appears to be a slow transition from the 60s all the way up to the late 70s, where cases of surviving elements from films and projects do heavily more increase. The reason why I say America more so than the rest of the world is that the major film industries of that country, such as Hollywood, have the financial royalties to invest in with their film archives, as you do need to keep up the maintenance and the civilities. Other countries such as Britain had a failing film economy at the time. Hammer Studios, who went under during the late 70s, thought of nothing when they junked all their negatives to their films, knowing that they exist in other archives. A major mistake and a huge loss to UK film history as now they've only got inferior copies to work off for high-end restoration. Additionally, keeping that original archive may have saved now many legendary Lost Hammer deleted scenes. But going back to the US, why was this somewhat transitional period going on in the first place? Well, that may have been down to the more steadily affordable media of viewing movies in your own house. Additionally, when movies were beginning to be screened on TV, and to utilise the monetization of ad breaks, that they extended the runtime by re-including back in many deleted scenes. During the 80s, as the home media market was establishing itself, a selected number of film companies began looking inwards to their film archive to seek out particular extended titles, which had been heavily rumoured about amongst film's enthusiasts. Laurence Olivier's epic Richard III was drastically cut down for his international releases, that these versions became the standard for distribution. Although in the 80s, Romulian's films took the immense undertaking to restoring the film to its original London premiere. For its time, the project was deemed to be immensely successful for film restoration, as the runtime was nearly at the equivalent of the original version. And while Warner Brothers were unsuccessful into relocating the original cut to The Wizard of Oz, they were able to rediscover many treasures and goodies from the film, all of which were included for The Wizard of Oz 50th Anniversary VHS release. Another gala movie that had some sought after footage that was being searched for in the 80s was A Star Is Born. Ron Haver was granted permission by Warner Brothers to to search for their archive for the original 181 minute cut. They did have the full original soundtrack of the original cut, but not enough substantial footage to cover over the missing scenes. So to compensate for this, the project used production stills to illustrate many of the deleted scenes that had the audio, but no visual elements surviving. By the late 80s, it was becoming clear by the American government on the value of their film history, where the National Library of Congress opened up a film program called the Film Preservation Board, where every year since 1989, they select 25 titles to be administered to be preserved for future generations, for either being culturally or historically important. Although there are some stipulations for a film to qualify. First, there must be a print that exists, you can't exactly preserve a lost film, as well it must be more than a decade old, and it must be a version of the film as it was first distributed. This was a reinforced qualification, due to back in the 80s it became somewhat of a popular 
popular trend to colorize old black and white movies, which many film historians saw as vandalizing the original work. The home media market upgraded from VHSs which degrade over time, from DVDs to Blu-ray which are far more durable. The format also includes a vastly better picture quality, and also is more user-friendly and convenient than Laserdisc. As well, home media can also provide bonus features, featuring exclusive behind-the-scenes material. Film companies would have been aware at the very least the value of unused film footage by the late 70s at the very latest, so everything should logically still exist in their archive by that point. So, it seemed by the 90s that we should have had a fairly successful system into preventing missing media for film and television. Well, the thing is, it wasn't exactly perfect per se. Enthusiastic viewers and fans alike would come to realise that there's more missing media that's out there than what companies had initially released. The internet would only amplify their megaphone, the research that they would conduct going through old advertisement material, putting two and two together, realising on the substantial amount that is still missing. These were looking over projects that would have been made less than 20 years ago, so these pieces of lost media would have more than likely still existed in some capacity. They were just hiding within the company's archive which for one reason or another didn't see it as economically viable to release them. So it seemed like in this situation that it was going to be up to the viewers to take the matter into their own hands. In 1987, Kaleidoscope was founded, a non-profit organisation where they seek out lost British television programmes. Regardless as to how invested the original copyright holders are, leading to some quite major rediscoveries of lost episodes, such as Steptoe and Son and Dad's Army. They're also renowned for their special screenings. In collaboration with the BFI, since 1993, they've been running the campaign Missing Believed Wiped Event, showing on the new rediscoveries that were made that year. You never know what someone's going to want in 30 years' time. And that's why Kaleidoscope has always fought tooth and nail to keep everything, you know. Even though many people have said, well, you're mad. You're mad to keep it all. Who's going to want to watch it all? But people do. But more so, the internet was ideal for amateur researchers to exchange content in file sharing sites. For movie fans, this brought in the accessibility of sharing work prints, early rough cuts to movies that may have exclusive scenes that can't be seen anywhere else. These work print copies would often be traded via person A exchanging a rarer work print with person B. This would be a fairly underground operation in very small circles, since that this does border on the issues of copyright and deliberate piracy. In the early 2000s, this led to an FBI investigation, which by consequence the doxing that went on led to the loss of many rare and exclusive work prints which have not resurfaced on the internet since. Despite that, the rather niche community of this type still goes on to this day, although it's still largely inaccessible for the mass public to access to, unless you know the right places to look in. There was a growing niche interest between fandoms, taking an interest of an unreleased piece of media from their favourite piece of property, lovers of children's media, that noticed that many things such as the many segments from Sesame Street, some of the older stuff had not been re-shown in years, movie buffs were they noticed with the film of Little Shop of Horrors, that there was a completely alternative ending that was more faithful to the stage version, but could only be viewed via a low quality work print online and enthusiastic viewers of television, where the broadcast special Australia's Naughty's Home Videos was interrupted mid-transmission after while watching the show the head of the company despised the final product, leaving the final portion of the show unavailable to watch for many many years. All these groups had this one thing in common, their interest of the unreleased stuff, but they were just lacking a platform to accommodate to discuss on all of these different topics. Before that, I was just a computer repair guy who loved gaming, anime, horror movies, and other sort of nerd culture related stuff, I guess some might say. So my first introduction to Lost Media was when the 2000 uh, Nickelodeon horror movie Crybaby Lane was found by a Redditor in August of 2011. Feeling of seeing this almost mythical movie that had only aired one time that I had read about countless times on uh, like 4chan's Paranormal Board and uh, a few other places was just really surreal and that really opened my eyes to how rewarding finding lost media can be. So after Crybaby Lane was discovered I started looking into other pieces of lost media and keeping a little notepad text file with a list of them all 
and most of the stuff I looked into back then came from suggestions in uh, recurring 4chan threads that I'd post in like the the paranormal and the cartoon boards. And then one night in uh, late November of 2012, November 30th to be exact, someone in one of the threads suggested somebody make a wiki. So from memory what happened was someone else in the thread actually jumped on that idea before I did uh, and they made a very basic sort of rudimentary wiki called the Lost Videos Wiki. But it then dawned on me that hey you could go way beyond the scope of just videos. So I decided to start my own wiki iteration which I settled on calling the Lost Media Wiki. And side note, apologies to the Lost Videos Wiki guy, I probably stole his thunder a little bit there but hey they were my threads you know. And I knew that I was willing to spend some serious time and effort on it so that's how it all began really. Um, for what it's worth I don't use 4chan anymore, it's a pretty horrid place. I guess the, the worst side of it was largely kept out of the the paranormal and uh, cartoon boards. 2014 was a pretty turbulent year since that was the year we decided to move away from Wikia to our own independent host, and Wikia did not take that news well at all. They caught wind of us wanting to move and basically told us that we couldn't actually move the wiki per se. We could create a new one, but the old Wikia version of Lost Media Wiki would remain online and would be given to, you know, new owners. They simply refused to shut it down so that they wouldn't lose the ad revenue presumably, which is one of the big reasons we chose to leave in the first place, you know, the huge torrent of ads that Wikia, or fandom now, I guess, would throw at you. It's just ridiculous. That and the lack of administrative control really ignited the feud between Wikia and myself and generally wasn't much fun. <laughs> we eventually did convince them to rename the old one to something else, and at the very least, they let us keep the LMW identity we had established. But I'd be lying if I said I didn't still hold a bit of a grudge there. 2015 was the year when we actually pressed forward with the move, and this also proved very stressful to me, being under a lot of pressure to get it done um, before the situation with Wikia inevitably turned more volatile. You know, not knowing a thing about how to program a media wiki site, I had to hire someone else to do it. Someone who, while a very nice guy, was admittedly not that great at coding. Anyway, we got through in the end. I pretty much single-handedly moved every last article from the old wiki to the new one, resulting in many late nights. And 2016 was also the year when LMW10 was introduced to the world as our official mascot. So LMW10 was created in 2015 by Reynard, um, also known as Goss Elm, who is now an LMW admin and also our resident artist. LMW10 is a Moe personification slash Gijinka, something non-human drawn as an anime girl, basically, uh, of the wiki itself. A source of inspiration for the design and look of LMW10 was based on the young lady seen in cracks. Gorsam found it a delightful coincidence that she was wearing clothing of white and green, which was the same colour choice for the website posted a drawing of her on the forums and before long she was our official mascot. Why do you think so many people are fascinated with lost media? I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that lost media searches are basically like real life treasure hunts that you can contribute to from the comfort of your home, you know? An alternate reality game almost, but the stakes are much more real when it comes to lost media searches. And that's addicting, like I can attest to that firsthand. That and the fact that people are generally drawn to mysterious unknown things, much of which lost media is to, to some extent. So yeah, a combination of, of those two factors I'd say. The thrill of the hunt, but also the curiosity of the unknown, come together as a team that supports one another. Some lifelong friendships have been formed even, and, and all stemming from this one niche interest. I think that's pretty awesome. I know that even some of them suffer from burnout. Some of us have doing this for half a decade or more, you know, unpaid passion project. We're tired, but we press on because uh, we ultimately love this community and the website and want the best for both. For nearly the last 20 years, the most popular video sharing site would be launched in 2005, YouTube. Depending what age you were when the site launched, the platform could very well mean two different things for two separate generations. If you were around about the ages of an adolescence to an adult, and you were searching up your favourite piece of media from your youth, and finding a video related to that topic, it very well may have been the first time you were reintroduced to that said property since your youth as YouTube could be an easily accessible platform for very niche topics. 
shining a light on properties that might have missed their chance to be featured on home media, or at least had very limited exposure beforehand. But then, if you first came across the website when you were just a child, you probably use it to watch and listen to your favourite content creating a generation where they can easily always go back to their favourite niche topics as a kid. The old slogan for YouTube used to always be broadcast yourself, making it universally user friendly. It seemed like anybody could have a voice on the platform, leading to the format of reviews and retrospective videos which would lead to many different subgenres. And then I started to admire the works of creators online when YouTube was becoming less of a platform to just watch cat videos and was more of a space for artists to make cool things and share their own stories. I'm sure nowadays people would find, oh, that's cringe stuff, but this was like way back in the olden days of YouTube, you know, when times were more simpler there. So, you know, just plush toys doing stuff, like yeah, that was uh, pretty common back then. It was just in 2011 we would have on what we would call today our first lost media content creator, when user MountingMan234 would come up with, at the time, a most unique concept. So I decided, uh, oh, I'll do like a tribute video to uh, Sheep in the Big City, that was a uh, old series on Cartoon Network that I don't see people talking about. And then after I did that, it's like, hey, you know, doing these like videos talking about like lesser known stuff, that's actually pretty fun to do. And also I just wanted to try and be a little more unique because like back then, you know, everyone was trying to be like the next angry video game nerd or nostalgia critic. So the name of Forgotten Media, I chose that specifically because I wanted to have the series be more focused on multiple medias. Forgotten Media was like everything. So when it came to researching certain topics, uh, usually it really relied on what memories I had with certain things. Uh, but other than that, yeah, it was just kind of just wandering around the internet. Sometimes I'd find something that looked interesting and other times I'd stumble upon something by accident. It's like, oh, that'll be an interesting topic to talk about for uh, my series. Um, yeah, it's uh, crazy to think that uh, my Forgotten Media series predates the, the Lost Media Wiki. It's a nice side. It has a lot of interesting information and other things that I didn't know of at the time. The thing with the internet is that it's always been famous for having a somewhat underdog rebel feeling towards it. Having people that discuss and are into subjects that are a little bit on the grey sector. And by the early 2010s, it was becoming quite trendy to have internet ghost stories. Or the more popular name for this subgenre, creepypastas. Online creepypastas that led to lost media icebergs that led to blame it on George videos. And indeed, it was thanks to the poster boy of the internet genre at the time that would aid into creating a new trend. Uh, but I first came across Lost Media. I googled something, and then in the bottom of the search results was Sesame Street 847. And it led me to an article about the Wicked Witch episode, the long lost uh, band episode of Sesame Street. And then I thought, oh wow, that's cool. Like an actual. You know, it's not a creepypasta, it's an actual lost episode that we just don't have. So I made the top 40. It was at first supposed to be a top 5, and then it grew to a top 10, a top 20, top 30. And eventually it ended up being a top 40 uh, lost or banned episodes of kid shows. Kind of the whole reason, because his vibe is always like unnerving and kind of like underground, if that makes any sense. And when he does the lost media videos, he used that vibe. And now it's associated with lost media YouTubers being all serious and shit, talking about Peppa Pig American dub. I was really into lost episode creepypastas. So like that feeling is still there, but I think because actual lost media like is real real, um, there's a bit more spice, a bit more intrigue to it. So yeah, there's a there's a bit of crossover and I like to keep that vibe in my videos. I recognized the characters in the thumbnail. It was like Jimmy Neutron and a bunch of stuff I had watched growing up, but I didn't know what that lost or banned meant. I had never thought about that in relation to cartoons or any form of entertainment really and there was a segment in that video about lost content about an episode of kablam that people didn't know if it existed or not it's called episode 29 out of all the other pieces of lost media discussed in that video that was the one that kind of stuck out to me the most because how can people not know if something existed? Again, it kind of goes along with that idea that I had never even considered stuff being lost before, but how could people not even know if something existed or not? It seems so strange to me. 
Lost Media YouTubers and, and how relatively quickly Lost Media videos sort of became their own genre of thing. A lot of the time it's packaged all in one neat, concise, entertaining video or series of videos. So I absolutely understand why people tend to prefer to, to learn about Lost Media through videos rather than articles. I wouldn't fault anybody who would rather watch a video than read an article, just as a quick aside from me there for clarification. Uh, definitely blame it on Jorge. Uh, he's my biggest inspiration. I just love that like sort of atmosphere um, that he made with his early list videos and I kind of wanted to like recreate that. Uh, yeah, it's cute. It's, it's neat. I try not to get too mad because when I was smaller, when I first started out, that was very clearly a Tats Top Videos clone. So I get it. You see content, you like that content. While Blamer and Hore was not exactly the first Lost Media content creator, but via the popularity of list-based videos, he definitely made it far more mainstream to the YouTube landscape. It's crazy because I think it just ultimately depends on how you like show it off. I mean, like cracks, I, I his video, it just kind of shows it off as this big mystery thing. Me, it's just kind of like if I was presenting cracks, it'd be like, OK, here's what happened. I think it really depends on how you present it. And I know with his past of doing like pre pasta videos and stuff like that, he kind of has this he, he has to keep to that vibe that he's already set up. But the difference with my videos and what I really tried to do back in those days to stand out was to make videos that talked about search efforts and talked about my journey to getting the piece of lost media found or whatever I could uncover. I wanted to bring something new to the table. That was always my goal back then with those videos. And maybe nowadays we've gone back to the spooky lost media kind of vibe. But back in those days, the spooky lost media vibe was the majority of what content was being made. So I also went out of my way to make things not spooky, not scary, because I didn't really see the need to make a lost cartoon pilot spooky, right? I wanted it to be more like a fun journey down the rabbit hole to see what we could uncover rather than like, oh, here's a scary spooky pilot that you've never seen. I remember they were different from Jorge's videos because they were shorter and they were single topic videos. I felt really inspired and felt like I could do lost media videos myself one day. My favorite video I've made would probably be 10 interesting pieces of lost media. And just everything seemed to flow perfect. The music, the script, the visual, it just, it really came together and I felt something inside like, okay, I'm doing this right. This is what I envisioned myself doing those years ago when I was just watching LSSQ's videos, you know, thinking of what I could do in the future. Although I do feel like my videos get better each time I put one out. That one really sticks sticks in my head as, as a milestone. I wanted something kind of unique that fit what I wanted to do with the channel. So I created the persona of Seeker, this detective-like character who was seeking out various pieces of lost media. He's just over there in the shadows. Hey, I heard you guys talking about Roger Rabbit. I can help with that. Oh, uh, him. But for my catchphrase, it is just what I say. When I greet people, I just say, oh, hi there. It's just something I've always done. I don't know <laughs> where exactly that came from. I didn't know how to start my first video off. And I was like, just say what you always say. Oh, hi there. <laughs> the community is a big plus And the fact that us content creators are like one big family. <laughs> lost media dad. I guess I've always thought of myself as more of the lost media zaddy. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know where this comes from. Is it because I'm older, because I'm married, or I just keep my videos PG for the most part? Molly and I don't want kids, so yeah, I'm willing to accept uh, being the lost media dad. I think it still is niche, but now I'm seeing like a whole other, a whole lot of creators like making their own videos. So it's just like with any other fad on YouTube, like you know, internet mysteries or tech reviews. It's just becoming like a like a category, I guess. I feel like for anybody getting into the lost media fandom or community, like if they want to make videos about it or dive into certain aspects, I just choose a specific topic or like theme of lost media. Like for me, I'm really into lost internet media, like websites, videos, all that sort of stuff. It's the most interesting to me, but it could be a different aspect for anybody. It doesn't matter how niche or how big it is, choose a specific thing instead of going all over. Look into things that are nostalgic for you or things that you find personally interesting. And um, that way it'll just be a lot more fun. Um, and I just think it comes down to people are interested in different things, right? Like not everyone is going to be interested in every topic. Um, so if you go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to rally a big search team and we're going to get this found. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. But there will be some people who find your thing interesting. There will be some people who are going to help you out. And, you know, in that way, as long as you have a little group of 
people who are willing to search for it, then you can make progress. It doesn't matter how big or small the search is. You can definitely search for your own topics by yourself. And maybe after you've gathered so much data or so many leads, you can actually present that in the forums or the Discord server. And people will be like, oh, that's really interesting. Look at all the stuff they found. I kind of want to join this search now. So it's all kind of dependent on the topic and, you know, how much content's been found for. We live in an age where the collective knowledge of the entire planet is at our fingertips at basically all times. And I really believe it's a reaction to this that makes people obsessed over cataloging and archiving every piece of history and every piece of lost media. I know a lot of people look at lost media from a nostalgic point of view, and that's totally valid, but I've always approached it from a kind of preservationist point of view. What's perhaps broader the appeal of lost media is the surge of interest of lost international projects, such as missing media in other countries. While American topics have maintained to be the most researched and advertised in the community, we're slowly seeing that draw of interest into other territories, for other pieces of lost media in other cultures and countries. But the biggest YouTube channel to focus on missing media not exclusive in the West is actually an American herself. Back around 2015 is when I started my channel, and that point in time, my health was pretty poor. I was pretty bedridden, I didn't really get out much, in all honesty. Watch somebody, like, do a let's play or discuss a topic kind of motivated me to do it myself because it was a kind of a method of connecting to people without having to physically exert myself. Just like little things like how Japanese society works, how it's such an old culture with so much history, uh, just fascinated me to um, a great deal. I'm very excited excited and happy about being the voice for lost media, well, lost Japanese media or Japanese media internet mysteries as a whole. That excites me, but also that comes with a lot of responsibility. A little bit of weight on my shoulders because Japanese is a very difficult language, and though I've been studying it for a long time, I still make mistakes. I am still not completely fluent. I'm not a native speaker. I'm not native Japanese. So with this... <laughs> I, I was gonna say with great power comes great responsibility, but it's kind of true because if I mistranslate something that's kind of on me and there's a lot of pressure in that regard to like represent topics. Some of the topics I discuss are kind of dark and I just want to be both respectful and accurate and it's a little tricky. And also certain people being greedy with lost media like saying, ooh, I have this piece here, do you want it? And then they like want to charge you for it, which is ludicrous. Rap City Straight Kids in 2015. <laughs> This one was rough. Had successfully made contact with the director, Colin Slater, and that Colin was willing to sell a copy. We were getting along well, things were going smoothly, and this is when he told me that he had not had one copy transferred at the lab, but two, before I had even paid him, mind you. And now he was down the cost of two transfers, or around 300 Australian dollars, and that he was not going to waste his time with me anymore. This made absolutely zero sense to me. Why would you get a digi beta tape digitized twice when you can just copy the first digital file in a matter of seconds? So a few days later, I begrudgingly made my way to the bank to send him the outrageous amount of $350, all in the pursuit of this crappy movie. <laughs> and then a month had passed with no sign of him. Still, despite my numerous messages, by the time three months had passed, I had pretty much given up and was just ready to accept that I'd been scammed and, you know, so I decided to call him out in the comments and make public the fact that he had taken my money and then immediately ignored every single email that I had sent him after paying. And well, this time he finally noticed me. <laughs> Half a year after his last response, he finally sent me the download link for the film. And I'm thinking to myself, after paying more than twice what I should have, you better believe I'm putting this online. Some of the more toxic, uh, like smaller communities and like the gatekeeping uh, that kind of happens sometimes uh, in regards to lost media and like lost media searches. The worst aspect would be people going at creatives in a negative way, almost trying to pull this this media out of them. You know, for example, when L Supersonic Q made the Me and My Friends video years ago, I remember people went at this executive, this woman, and with like threats and stuff, trying to get her to release a pilot episode. And it's like, come on, man, like, like what are you doing? And I remember L Supersonic Q had to take the video down because of that, you know, because people did that. Or let's say people demand stuff be leaked, even though sometimes you can't leak certain things because you gave your word to the sources that provided said media. To me, that would just be really unprofessional and would go against the wishes of the people who are gifting the media. It's, it's just not a good look. And you want those people to trust you because if they don't trust you, it's going to be a lot harder to find lost media. 
Yeah. And their wishes need to be respected, ultimately. And when it can't be respected, it doesn't really paint the community in a very good light. Uh, when there's actually so many wonderfully hardworking preservationists and lost media explorers that are all working together to bring lost media to life and to preserve it in the best way that they can. So I, I really feel like that is an underappreciated detail. And those people who put all of that time in, to me, are what actually makes the community. Using the new technology that is running away with the law and a copyright law that says that taping off the air is technically a violation. And Sony, who makes recorders, has now been taken to court by Universal Pictures and Disney Studios. That case will take months and the decision will ultimately affect us all. This actually went on for five years, leading Sony to appeal to the High Court, with the whole case only just by nearly 50-50 voting in Sony's favour. The concept of home recording for personal use was indeed uncharted territory, for companies being uncertain of what to make of it. And looking back in hindsight, that action certainly seemed to be a little bit unfavourable. Mr Monkhouse had been accused of conspiracy to defraud film distributors of hiring fees. Yet, said the judge, the only evidence that might have had any direct effect on distributors was when he'd lent a copy of the James Bond film Goldfinger to a friend to show at his son's birthday party. Sadly, by consequence, film collectors hearing stories of individuals having legal repercussions of either taping a program on TV or obtaining rare films in desperate needs led them to unnecessarily pushing their collections further down into privacy, fearing what others may make of them or even how they may be perceived by the companies, when it was becoming clear to many media corporations that many of their lost treasures may only still exist via private collections, so it became important to not be disencouraging towards amateur enthusiasts of film and television. But where companies can at the very least maintain of being professional, their viewers who as equally wanted to see the material safe and sound could sometimes be very irrational. Now of course, this all came from a place of love, and there will forever be people coming from a place of endearing intention, but you can't control a crowd on what they're going to say. During the 80s, there was a rise in fan communities having a more vocal voice, local meetups, fan magazines, and occasionally being invited on talk show programs. It would become clear to most people who would pay attention on what exactly they were thinking. In 1983, David Steed had been able to track down part three of the Whale in Space, a then currently missing Doctor Who episode in the archive. He had always intended to return the episode to the BBC, although due to some complications, this return was delayed quite a bit. During this time frame, the episode had leaked out on VHS to the fan community community. David's name additionally slipped out there of the individual who may have possibly had the original copy. This led to some hurtful remarks towards him. Gary Russell, who wrote an anonymous letter in a fan magazine, which had widely brought the fandom's community's knowledge towards this missing episode, has since regretted escalating the situation to such an extent. While it's difficult to grasp as to why film collectors are so reluctant to return missing material, and while the answer does vary from individuals, sometimes just being purely based on their selfishness of being proud of having such rare items. But in other cases, it's been softly implied by people acting as the intermission between both parties that fandom's perception might be a contributing factor. They're not very certain of you know how they'd be treated or and the, the one thing they always say to me is well you've returned lots of episodes and look how you've been treated. My answer to that is always that's a minority of people. That's not the majority. I tell you now, I've met the majority. They are the most articulate, wonderful, loving, creative people you could ever meet. In late 2020, someone posted in the unidentified media section of the LMW Discord looking for an old animation that they had seen as a child in the early 2000s in Australia. And Eat Carpet is something that I find very nostalgic and I'm always on the lookout for more of. So that was pretty much enough to get me on board. His father was in poor health and he wanted to find this animation and rewatch it with his dad while he still could. That was the thing that really made me end up being like, okay, I have to help with this one. This is about more than lost media now. Uh, in 2016, I was going through a lot. I legitimately hated myself. I felt like my life was being destroyed. There was a point like legitimately gonna end myself.
and soon after I found a copy of the movie on YouTube and began flicking through it. So I sent it over and he was too afraid to watch it at first in case I was wrong. I can understand not wanting to be disappointed by getting his hopes up only for it to be the wrong thing. But nope, thankfully it was the movie he had seen all those years ago. He was able to show it to his dad and then he ended up becoming a patron as a thanks, which was really nice of him. But yeah, that was such a wholesome experience and so incredibly satisfying too. was gonna go through with it i made a post i left the i left the wiki i left the i like deleted my account i get a call on discord from a one diet i end up spilling my guts to him about what's happening i was like crying saying like what was going on in my life and diet helped me through it this community not existed i'd be in the fucking ground in this community it's been such a welcoming community i've met, I made so many good friends trying to get in contact with a creator about a pilot or about a series those are the good aspects you know like us coming together and finding things and then the whole world can see it that is the best aspect of the community to me and the best thing to do is not create a fuss around that let let it let it work its way out is my, is my best advice if anything comes to light i think you know everyone else will get to see it you know it's as simple as that cheers to the lost media wiki for 10 years and here's to another 10 thank you